So I'm going to start. And I want to say welcome to everyone. As I said, my name is Betsy McKinney, and I'm the founder and CEO of It's Time Network. Thank you for joining us for today's Calling All Women and Allies virtual convening. And welcome as well to Kim Desmond, Director of the Denver Office on Women and Families, and to Nancy Richmond, Professor of the University of Denver at the University of Denver, and they will be leading later portions of this call. Today we'll begin with presentations followed by a time to answer your questions. You can type your questions into the Q&A box as they occur to you and at any time during the call, so don't hesitate. URLs and links that are mentioned on the call will be posted in the chat box, so be sure to look there for those resources. Also, a recording of this call will be um, sent in a follow-up email for you to review or share with others. So let's begin. It's Time Network is a growing network of individuals and organizations working collaboratively to accelerate gender equality and to achieve a world that works for all people and all life. To do this, we're building and infrastructure for collective action and impact city by city. So we can work together across issue area silos to advance common agendas for gender equality in our communities. Working in issue silos often prevents us from creating effective change. Women and women's organizations need long-term infrastructure to reach a new level of collective activism and progress on the issues that we care about. Individual women's organizations and others are already tackling local, national, and global issues from racial and social justice, economic inequality, environment, poverty, global security, and more. Women and allies are already leading in essential ways, yet we are still so far away from achieving gender equity. Can we build upon the connections between us? Can we find common values and build our capacity for collective action together? We can. And the best way to do it is through collective impact. So what is collective impact and why, it is so, why is it so effective and why are we using it in our Network City program? And Hmm, we're going to pause for just a moment for one reason or another. My slide is not advancing. All right, give me one second. Huh, there we go. All right, so right now, many individual organizations and agencies are working towards similar goals. They often work in silos with separate funding and distinct strategies and action plans for achieving progress and social change. They also have to compete with one another for resources and typically follow, um, and they typically follow different plans for similar goals and often without even knowing about one another's efforts. Instead, if these groups are able to work together for a common agenda and share resources, knowledge, and skills, progress can be achieved more effectively and the odds of success are much greater. Collective impact provides that necessary support through the development of backbone infrastructure to achieve results that are measurable and sustainable. It's important to note that the collective impact model is constantly evolving to incorporate learning gained from practice and experience as we track those changes and evolve the model for collective impact. So to give you a sense of what collective impact looks like in action, here are a few examples. Right now, many individuals and organizations and agencies are working towards similar goals. They often work in silos with separate funding. But Strive, a Cincinnati nonprofit, identified a student achievement crisis in the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Metro School District that individual schools, agencies, and organizations were unable to address alone successfully. Strive brought up school leaders together four years ago to work toward a common agenda and share shared measurement tools 
to track improvement in student achievement. Since then, STRIVE has been successful in helping students make substantial progress in dozens of key areas. They're also able to track and measure that progress from year to year, so they can continue to evaluate and improve their plans based on data. Another example is Shape Up Somerville, a citywide collective impact campaign to reduce, reduce obesity and promote health in the city of Somerville, Massachusetts. When it was started, 46% of first, second, and third graders in Somerville were overweight or at risk for being overweight. Shape Up Somerville is the backbone support, bringing individuals and organizations together in the community for a common agenda in the city. Year over year, the average weight of children involved in the initiative have lost a statistically significant amount of weight on average. To learn more about the collective impact, impact model, click through the link in the chat box to learn more. At It's Time Network, we've developed our network city program that facilitates and supports collective impact starting at the local level. Each network city chapter establishes a local advisory council or LAC made up of diverse women leaders from across all sectors in each city. The LAC starts by assessing the status of women and girls in their area, begins to grow the network locally by inviting individuals and organizations to participate, and then creates collective impact projects with member organizations to address the most pressing needs. The LAC continues to grow the network, inviting more individuals and organizations in their city so that more and more and more of us are informed and engaged. The more individuals and organizations that support this collective action, the more effective we can facilitate progress. We're currently piloting a program in San Francisco and Denver, and we're ready to take it to scale in 2018. We'll share more about the two pilot cities in a moment, but first we need to talk about one of the key elements of the collective impact model, a common agenda. One of the most important elements of the collective impact model is building a common agenda. While different groups are working towards a similar goal, they may define the challenges slightly differently or have different priorities for addressing those challenges. With the collective impact approach, it's important to agree upon a shared mission, a shared definition of the challenge, and commit to a set of strategies or action steps. On our last call, we talked about our first pilot city in San Francisco that is supporting the Stronger California Legislative Package. That is, in effect, a common agenda for the whole state of California that organizations can work in support of. But in our second network chapter, in Denver, there is an inspiring level of women's leadership and a long history of advancing gender equity, and we'll be talking about that today. Though there have been promising advancements for the rights of women and girls in Colorado over the past several years, there still is a great deal of work to be done to leverage that work from the past and to strengthen it going forward. For example, at almost every educational level, women in Colorado earn less than men who have lower educational qualifications than the woman. In Colorado, more than one third of households headed by single mothers with children under 18 live in poverty. The Denver chapter will officially launch at its time 2017, the Denver Gender Equity Summit on May 31st. It's Time Network is hosting this summit in partnership with the Denver Office on Women and Families and the Women's Commission, who do amazing work for women and girls in the Denver area. The summit will bring together thought leaders, decision makers, and engaged individuals to develop a common agenda to address systemic inequity in Denver and to increase economic security for women. Kim Desmond, director of the Denver Office on Women and Families, will share about their important work and how the summit will help us build a common agenda in Denver. So Kim, I'll leave it to you now. I'm gonna stop share and you can uh, put up your presentation and take it from here. 
And then I know, Kim, that you, there we go. Have you got it? Thank you, Betty, for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And Kim, while you're getting ready for the share, I just want to uh, make sure everyone knows that on the call today, we have over 16 states represented on the call. We have primarily people from California and um, Colorado, but we have a tremendous audience of people who are eager, I think, to hear about the Equity Summit. So go ahead. Well, welcome, and I'm excited that we have such reach um, on this call to hear about what we're doing here in the city and county of Denver. And I will be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our state, Colorado, and looking forward to hearing and hopefully hearing some familiar names on the call. So shout out to our Colorado people on the call. So we're going to really dig into what this work looks like on a local level in partnership with stakeholders across the city. So talking about how we collectively impact women and girls in our city and how we're using the summit as a jumping off point to help leverage our work and provide our mayor recommendations around actionable things to do in our city. So you all can see my screen, I, I assume, am I correct? Perfect, okay, let's get started. So as Betsy stated, and I, and I will be again remiss to say, um, this partnership with this time Network has allowed us to, to produce a summit at this scale. So definitely grateful and thankful for the technical assistance and the staff at this time to give us this platform, but also to partner to put this summit into fruition. And you will be joined later on by my colleague, Nancy. She's also one of my commissioners. I say colleague, all things get things done. So she's gonna dig in and share her brilliance around how we're using data to inform this conversation. So what we're gonna touch on during this presentation, we're gonna talk about why we should partner to collectively impact women and girls. We're gonna talk about the ways in which we approach this work and to really solicit cross-sector participation which includes local government, for-profit, non-profit, business sector. The summit has actually literally been a um, labor of love in that we were able to get a lot of involvement from around our state, not just our region. So we're gonna talk about how that worked out for us. And then last but not least, we're gonna share a little bit with you about our summit. Um, and I'll just say this, we did zero social media marketing for this summit. And at this juncture, we are full to capacity. We'll have about we will have 440 attendees in the space, all talking about gender equity and inclusion in one space. So let's jump in. So while planning this summit, one of the questions that we got, and one reason why we framed the summit the way that we did, we wanted to set the stage and say, the work that we do is intersectional. So first and foremost, not only is it intersectional through the lens of race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, national origin, um, your, your status as a person who may identify or be living with a disability, but also the intersections to structures. So literally that's how we set the foundation for this summit, is to say that these systems impact um, women within their communities, women within their workplace, their settings. So these are the external forces that really can change the way in which a woman is able to secure and reach economic self-sufficiency. So that was the way in which we approached our work with our partners. We were able to secure our partners through really getting um, the buy-in to say that we all have to, as Betsy was outlining, we all collectively have a role in this work. So our approach was to work with our Metro Mayor's Caucus, which is comprised of 41 mayors across the metro region. So we started there to say, from a local government perspective, we wanted our elected officials to be a part of this conversation. But we also wanted to pair um, our elected officials with key stakeholders in our city from the business sector. Um, we have the Women's Foundation of Colorado who's supporting the summit. So really this cross-sector approach to say, we are all doing different things and how do we work together to ensure that we can share some key practices, but also that we can learn from each other and put forth some tangible ideas. So this slide really just shows how interconnected our work is and how we are able to leverage what we're doing individually. In order to really um, leverage and work through the collective impact, kind of some of the language, we had to approach this partnership and we had to really outline the benefits for those partners. So for example, to get the participation from, we have probably close to 
uh, between 11 and 15 mayors across our um, region who will be supporting the summit. So much so that some mayors didn't even want to be on a panel. They elected to be in the audience because they wanted to make sure they were taking in all of the rich information coming from our key stakeholders in our community. So outlining the benefits included the constituents that they serve. So we had to outline the business case for equity and inclusion to our mayors. We not only did we talk about the, the feel good stuff, but we also talked about how this can be quantified and what it means to have a representative workforce. So really getting our mayors aboard was really just outlining the benefits to those individuals as well as our key businesses in our city. And not only did we outline the business case, and Nancy's is going to talk more through the data pieces of that, but we really just let them know that we want to approach this work together and collectively. The important part of this summit really um, relied on the backbone support of the agency that I work for. It's the Agency for Human and Rights and Community Partnerships. We are a local government agency and we do work around social justice and human rights. And it's critical to have a key person or an office who's able to move the, the work along and really help foster relationships to get people in the same space to talk about that. So my office and my commission has served as the backbone support for this summit. I am again grateful to my commissioners who are actually their mayor appointees, but they're volunteers who dedicate their time, talent, and expertise. I see Nancy laughing on the screen because literally I would say it's like probably a part-time job at this point, but literally we're able to leverage our um, capacity of our commissioners and not only that, our agency and last but not least, the mayor's office here in our city. So we actually had the director of regional affairs who really helped lead our strategy on getting regional involvement. So I have to just shout out Mr. Anthony Graves for all of his support with getting this summit going. So early on, the important part of our summit was to co-create goals and outline a scope of work. So we actually put together a um, summit planning committee, which was comprised of organizations from around our city. And together we came up and thought through the objectives and goals that we wanted to accomplish for our summit. And that was actually key in this process. Um, when we were approached with the opportunity to do the summit, we really didn't know how we would approach the work. We knew we wanted to do a convening, but really not knowing what topics and all of those key factors. And so the planning committee actually helped us think through how to really narrow down to key focus areas, which you will see here coming up shortly on my slide. And then last but not least, really clarifying the impact was a key part as well. So when we got to, I would say, we started this work literally in July, I can't believe it's gonna be almost a year, um, pulling together organizations from around our city. We started out with a blank campus, literally just asking our organizations key questions. What are the things that we want for our city? What do we mean when we say equity and inclusion? So it really just started out with like a lot of language and then we ended up with coming away with a pretty clear goal which was to convene a stake, convene key stakeholders from around our city, which comprised of those mayors, those businesses. So that really was the way in which we formed it. And then just doing a lot of mapping. And so we really got to um, our work around defining our, our focus areas through just talking through and asking open-ended questions to our committee. What are the things that really impact women in the workplace? So when we asked that key question, we came away with a laundry list of things and I'll be honest with you, when we first approached the work, it was in silos. So we had, um, it took us about maybe, I would say three months to really get to where we were saying that our work is very so interconnected, but um, we had to walk through and say, how do we overlay the structural things with the workplace focus areas? And that's where we were able to find our focus areas. So one topic area is career advancement. So that includes how you retain, recruit, making sure you have equal pay practices, those types of things that impact women in the workplace. And also, what are the types of environments that we're in? So creating inclusive cultures is key. And then the policies that govern. So it's not just a matter of having, having good policies on the book. It's about really creating the, the environment where people are able to feel included and welcome. And when I say people, it's unpacking that term. So we say women through an intersectional lens. So we're talking about women of color, um, women um, from various ethnic origins, um, gender identity. We're covering the whole spectrum when we reference um, gender in our work. 
So that's the way in which we were able to get to this piece and then overlay those societal things that impact. And then we said we wanted to be so ambitious that we want to have some tools for advancing equity and inclusion. That may be another conference call, Betsy, that we can talk through some tools where you're able to walk away with a key way to do some action planning around selecting one of these topics. So the Women's Commission, we've created a guide, Different Thrives When Women Thrive. And essentially, it's an action-oriented tool where you can take one of these focus areas and you can plug in and you can mind the gaps, dig in and say, what do we want to focus on? So essentially, our tool goes well with um, this time network's guide, the mayor's guide for accelerating gender equality, because they've outlined a series of checklist items to say, if you are a mayor, you can do these things. So essentially, you can take any one of those items from the um, it's time guide and then plug it into our action oriented tool to really get to work. So really, when you think about the work that we do, you really got to think about the types of resources you're going to allocate to the programs, researching the policies, making sure that everyone feels included. And you really cannot do this work absent of equity and inclusion. So you, we we're asking all of our, our stakeholders at the summit to make that commitment. And we're asking them to make that commitment through a multi-sector lens. So we're saying that if you are in the business community, please make that commitment to um, equity and inclusion. If you are in local government, do the same as well. So definitely saying here is the commitment, but then also making the commitment to say, what are the resources to make sure that you are creating um, parity, to make sure that you're creating opportunity for um, all of the employees in your um, workplace settings. So I almost jumped past the slide. You see that, Nancy? I, I did see that. I did see that. <laughs> yes. Ken talks for me all the time. <laughs> yes, I talk for Nancy all the time. So yes. before we transition to Nancy's portion of this presentation, I want to just take some time and field any questions from you all in virtual land around how we put this together and even maybe talking through some of the phase two of the same. Kim, I think we're going to hold the questions till the end. <laughs> Yeah, so if anyone does have questions, start typing them into the Q&A and we'll um, present them at the end. So Nancy and uh, Kim, if you want to go forward, go right ahead. Yes, so Nancy. So thanks, Kim, and thanks, Betsy, for the opportunity. Go back a slide if you would, uh, Kim. Just to say that we, what I'm going to do it in the next, actually I'm going to make it five to six minutes since I know we are moving quickly, is to talk about how we um, were trying to frame the summit what kinds of information we provided as background, as, as getting people revved up to start thinking about how can they solve the issue. So this is, this oh. is. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my, um, this is our definition of gender equity. And I think it's really an important one to step back and look at what are we talking about when we talk about gender equity. Um, and reading it, the process of allocating resources, programs and decision making fairly to allow everyone, regardless of gender, access to the full range of opportunities and benefits that come from participating and leading in society. I just want to emphasize two components of that. That is opportunities. We're looking at what are the opportunities that women have and access to the benefits. So there's two prongs to that, opportunity and benefits, all of which are there to make sure that women are participating as fully as they want to be um, in our economy and in our society at large. And as Kim mentioned, we don't think gender equity is possible absent that commitment to inclusion, to recognizing that we are not just women, but we are women that have um, come with lots of different identities from race to class to ability to sexual orientation. All of those things matter to how our abilities to access opportunities and take advantage of benefits. And so we, oh, we are asking our summit folks to be mindful of those differences among us and to think through policies that might be beneficial to one, but might also harm another. So just be thoughtful about um, who we are. Next slide. One of the ways, one of the metrics that we have for looking at the question 
question of gender equity is, is the earnings ratio. And here I want to emphasize something to all, that this earnings ratio, often described as the wage gap, but really it is the earnings ratio, is a composite measure. It is a snapshot. It tells us how well we're doing. And when we look at that, what we see is that we were doing, we're doing better than we were in 1950 or like say 1970 when we start really started capturing this information and we saw some escalation but over the last 15 to 16 years our progress at least as measured by an earnings ratio has definitely um, uh, plateaued or become more steady next slide and of course, we do know this is Colorado, but it's true for around the nation that, um, again, your, your race certainly matters to your earnings ratio. This slide represents what individual, uh, the average woman would make compared to the average white man. And so you see there's quite a difference. When you're an average white woman, you're going to have a gap of 19% more or less, but it's significantly higher if you're a black woman or Hispanic woman. And again, that references our, our imp the importance that we place on this question of intersectionality and the need to kind of look beyond a particular woman's experience to make sure that we capture um, all that we can. Next slide. So <clears throat> one of the ways to think about this composite measures, this gap, is sort of how does it get filled? Like what is it made up of? And again, referencing that it's not just equal pay for equal work. And we hear that a lot from our politicians and it's critically important, but it is by no means what makes up the earnings ratio or that composite measure of how well we're doing on gender equi um, equity. Education is, um, as often cited as more education, you're going to do better, you're going to earn more, and yes, that's true. It's better to have more education than not, but education isn't what is filling up um, or making up this wage gap. In fact, as Betsy alluded to, the more education you have, the higher the wage gap, and in the q and I can talk about some of the reasons that is true. Certainly a large measure of what constitutes this gap, and remember the gap, again, is just a composite, a metric for how well we're doing, but a big gap, proportion of the gap, is something we call um, occupational segregation. And I should mention I'm a sociologist, and so I'll use a little sociology jargon. And again, in the Q&A, ask me to unpack that, if you will. Occupational segregation refers to the idea that women are in it's several ideas. One is that women are in occupations that pay less. So when you look at the composition of, say, retail workers, and you compare it to the composition of, say, engineers, you see that men are disproportionately more of engineers and less of retail workers where women tend to settle. There's a vast difference between the earnings capacity of the retail worker and the engineer. So some of that gap is explained by the fact that women and men work in different occupations. Even within the same occupation, say you're a doctor or an, or an educationist, a person in, in education, there are what we call um, within those job occupations differences so that women might be more likely to be early childhood educators than, let's say, high school math teachers. It turns out that early childhood educators are earn less than high school math teachers. So the fact that women are segregated in even within occupations matters a great deal. And there's another more nuanced um, um, component of segregation that I really want to spend some time with, and that's about our assignments, that even within the same job, when one wants to drill down to the assignments and ask this question, and Kim, can you go three slides forward for me for a second? One, two, three. Um, even within a particular job, we see that women and men may not be getting the same kinds of assignments that allows them to demonstrate their value. And this slide is brought to us by our friends at Catalyst. They, they did a study that found that men worked and were assigned projects that had bigger budgets, that had more people, so that when it came time for advancement and if one woman was set up against another man, the woman didn't quite have the same level of experience, but not because she didn't want it, but because she wasn't assigned to it. And we see that also in, um, in retail work and restaurant work. I can't tell you how many people in my own research tell me stories about being pulled off of the best shifts at the restaurant and not being able to get the tips that some of their male workers get. And so this is really an important component, something we need to look at as we think about our workspaces. 
back a few slides. So this question of occupational segregation, it's a big chunk of the wage gap. A second big jump is experience and hours, meaning how much time you spend in the workplace. That's a years, women take time off, but it's also hours. Again, not something that women always control. Um, we look at what constitutes a, a full-time worker. We know the full-time workers, we think of 48 hours, that's normal, that's typical, but there's an awful lot of full-time workers who are making 36 and 38. You don't have the hours, you're not given the shifts, you don't earn the money. So thinking about hours in that way is really important. And then caregiving is another component. We all know there's a motherhood penalty, a fatherhood premium, women take time off to take care of their families. All of that influences that gap in earnings. But notice at the very top, there's something that it's not quite at there. I filled in blue, it's all the way. There's still study after study shows us that even when we account for all the factors that we know that influence pay and earnings, there's still something, there's still a gap. And that gap in sociology terms is unexplained, but partly it's due to just simply with the fact that the, the person checked off a woman or checked off man when they um, articulate, articulated the survey. Okay, so those are that sort of some of the research, keep going, Pam, that, um, that, next slide, that informs our thinking about it. Um, I'm gonna quickly, really quickly, one slide forward, please. Okay, thinking about, all right, I just said what makes up the gap, what accounts for the gap, why does it exist is a different set of questions. Um, but we're gonna just mention four things. Second generation bias means that some of our organizational structures, patterns, patterns of interaction are, are designed in ways that inadvertently, sometimes it, um, rather distinctly benefit men while putting women as a, as a, at a disadvantage. Those are, so that bias is bias that's built into the way that we do things. Implicit bias is a more cognitive bias. It's about stereotypes that are, uh, affect our understanding of what women and men are capable of, and you all probably have um, um, thought about that. Individual mindsets are, we, many women have internalized the lack of fit. So there you think about the questions that people raise about negotiation, that when we don't know that women don't negotiate as often as, as men, and it's not because they don't want to. Well, sometimes they've internalized um, their, their lack of ability in that way. And of course, we also know that sometimes they're dinged for when they do negotiate, so maybe that's a rational basis. And the last thing is caregiving responsibilities and community obligations, all of which matter, um, again, to why women are not achieving equity as quickly uh, as we would like. Next slide. Um, so, so, we, so our summit focused on this kind of workplace. And we, as Kim mentioned, we talked about career advancement. We talked about, we talk about family-friendly policies. We talk about organizational culture. All these kind of dimensions of work that seem to matter to women's economic security. But we do so, and I want to just return back to this idea that's sort of central to Instime Network, is that we want to have these conversations without the silo that have traditionally kept us apart so that it's really hard to talk about the workplace and rules and, and policies that are going to affect changes in the workplace without also talking about transit. If you can't get to work, you can't earn. And this is all again about having women, giving women the opportunities to be full participants so that the workplace may actually be um, uh, working to their advantage, but they can't get there. Or, as many women I interview in my work say, I, they travel two hours or four hours, two hours in each way to get to work. Mm -hmm. That's nothing and that's impossible. So we are at the summit trying to link everything that we're doing at work to other issues from the transit to personal safety to affordable housing to where childcare is located. If affordable housing, gender lenses applied to this, if affordable housing is being built in places where there are childcare deserts, um, that doesn't always work for women. So it's great that it's a, there's affordable housing, but we need all of the infrastructure to come together um, to advance women's economic opportunity. Kim, I'll take it back to you. You, Kim, you, I'm mute. With all of these things that um, Nancy outlined, um, most certainly what we're 
not having this conversation is not enough, right? So we've had this conversation. I can't say it's been a generational conversation. It's been a historical conversation. So it's more than just having a conversation. So at the summit, we are um, migrating all of the, the feedback, not just from the panelists, but from our 440 plus attendees. And it's gonna be migrated into a report. So that's one of the, the pros to collaborating with It's Time Network. They've actually um, partnered with the uh, entity America Speaks who we're doing some 21st century interaction. And so literally on the day of the summit, we'll be able to come away with the key report that was prioritized by the individuals in the space. And so that will be handed out and posted on our site. And so that way individuals can walk away saying, what were the key themes and key gems that came away from all of the rich conversation and ideas. And after that, the Women's Commission then will take that report that's curated and then we'll do some analysis and determine some feasibility and then we'll align it with our mayoral budget priorities to say what are some things that we can do here in local government so to the earlier part of this conversation we're saying that everyone has a piece of this pie and from an intersectional lens and we need to make our commitment and as a women's commission then they will take this information and then they will go forth and then they will give the mayor recommendations to continue to make sure that we are an employer that prioritizes and promotes equity and inclusion for women in our workplace. One example of a recommendation that came out of Women's Commission, so we know that the um, mayor is supportive of our ideas, is that we provided the mayor with an I with a recommendation, a policy proposal to do a gender equity analysis by pay, by classification. So as Nancy stated in her slide around occupational segregation, one key finding that came out of our gender equity analysis was to really understand what classifications in our city are gender segregated. Now, these also trail along the lines of national segregated positions um, by gender as Nancy outlined. But so that recommendation actually came from our commission. And so we will, be, we will highlight that work, but that's an example of how when we provide our mayor with the recommendation around um, being more transparent with these things. Um, he has responded, so we will do the same with this summit. We will prioritize and probably come up with another list of, Nancy's laughing because he, she know we will, another list of about um, who knows how many. <laughs> I'm saying 10, hold me to that, Nancy, recommendations to give to the administration to continue to make sure that we're an equitable employer. Not only that, phase two of the summit also is for us to continue to build cross-sector partnerships within workplace settings across our region. So we have a wealth of individuals who are contributing to the summit, which includes support from our local chambers of commerce. So literally looking forward to building more, um, more capacity and coalitions around equity and inclusion in our city, which include partnerships with our Metro Mayor's Caucus. It includes um, partnerships with the business sector and also our nonprofit organization. So we will continue to do that and we will continue to use our guide as a tool to say, here's how you um, dedicate the action and the resources to this work. And then of course, when the local council is um, definitely up and running in our city, supporting the It's Time Network with that collective impact agenda and some of the things that they're going to bring to our city. So we're looking forward to that. So the summit is really just a foundation for all the work that's to come for our summit. Great. Thank you, Kim. And when you're ready, I'll take the screen share. And I am ready. Okay, great. And, um, and so before we move on, um, I wanted to give you a quick update on the San Francisco chapter in our network city program and how you can get involved. We're doing amazing work in Denver and we'll move on to that question and answer session in just a second. But in San Francisco, as I mentioned, we're building the network growing the number of organizations and individuals to get behind uh, the Stronger California legislation and other work. But the California Stronger California legislation is a really important legislative package that every woman and ally in California can help support in the coming uh, four or five months. So if you're on the call from California, register to become part of its time network, sign up, tell other people in your network to sign up, if you are in Denver, 
and you're in Colorado on the call, get people to sign up for Denver so that you can, we can share information about the summit and begin to build the collective capacity in the Denver Metro and Colorado, the, the state of Colorado. So um, join the network and also um, we, as more cities become part of the network, our capacity for collective action begins to scale from the city level to the state to the national and beyond. So for those of you who are not in California or Colorado, so glad you're on the call. It's essential that you begin to tell people in your city, in your state, we have more than 25 cities already that want to come online in the next 2018 cohort of network cities chapters. And so you can imagine what might happen in your city, in your town, if we were able to do a summit and to begin to convene local organizations to assess the status of women and girls and develop common agendas. So as you're hearing this information about California and Colorado, hopefully it's stimulating your imagination about what can happen next in your city and your state. So spread the word. So um, the next step, I guess, um, Christine, or not Christine, um, Kim and Nancy is to go on to Q&A. And I know Christine is on the call listening, but Kate, you are going to be uh, fielding some of the questions. So do we have some questions that we're ready to start with? We do indeed. Um, and I just wanted to, as a reminder, hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Um, as a reminder, I know we've shared this a couple of times, but uh, if you have any questions at this point, feel free to, you can either type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll answer them uh, out loud or you can raise your hand and we can bring you on via video or over the phone if you're if you're dialing in so feel free to ask questions either way um, we do have a, a few questions ready now so uh, we'll get started so the first one is um, and I'm going to direct this towards Betsy just because I know that we've had this conversation many times and I, although I know Kim or Nancy could answer this as well but why do we say gender equity instead of gender equality Question. Oh, great. Oh, and I'd love to hear if anyone else has another reason. Yeah, but I'm, we're chomping at the bits for that one, Nancy, right? So, who, <laughs> Nancy, you, 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 gender equality um, as, as, uh, connotes that um, gender, everyone is equal across, you know, the gender spectrum. Um, and some people disagree. Some people think that men and women are not equal and that anyone um, described as equal is problematic. So gender equity is more about providing equal opportunity and that everyone is treated equitably and has the same opportunities to develop their gifts and talents, no matter how unique and different someone's um, uh, op, you know, experience is. So Nancy, is that what your understanding is, Kim? Um, I, I just add in that it, it, it really speaks to this question of equal opportunity, but mostly and an importantly fair opportunity. That is that we want to make sure that opportunities are fairly distributed um, in ways that um, allow everyone to participate in the way that they want to. And I think, and it's to their capacity. So I think that's why we, we really reference this idea of equity. It's not all about equality. And if you thought about the same equal pay for equal work is a kind of equality framework. And that's really important. And we really probably won't get equity unless we have equal pay for equal work, but it's so much more. And so it's really to open up our understanding of what it means with the end goal, right? Is for our participation our full participation in the economy and society as a whole. That's what we want. And I'll give you a, a workplace a workplace example, because I think that that definitely, you can see it, it's all of our attention, and we're definitely, we framed our summit through an intersectional lens, but through a workplace in terms of when you're looking through an equity lens, you're really looking at the tailor-made tools that you're providing in order for an individual to accomplish a given goal. And so in planning this summit, we've had to clarify a lot the difference between the two of those things. So for example, you may have a, a company or a local government say that 30% of our board is women. And so they said, we got parity because it's 30% women, but that's equality in the sense that if you're not saying it's equitable, so when you ask the question, disaggregate that data by race ethnicity, then there's a different response. So literally when you slice things by it, through, through the lens of equity, you're able to catch people who are left out in the margins. And so definitely a huge difference in it. It should definitely inform the work in terms of the tools and strategies used to approach parity. 
Great. Um, okay, so the next question that we have, this was asked um, when Kim, when you were talking about how the summit focus areas were developed. Um, the question is, was this process uh, just for government and for-profit businesses or were nonprofits included too? Most certainly so. Actually, to be completely honest with you, the most of our um, involvement around the summit host committee was our nonprofits. And these were nonprofits who were directly serving our women and girls. So we had nonprofits who were focused on economic security through providing soft and hard skills around um, preparing yourself to enter a workplace based on your individual circumstance. So we had government, for-profit, non-profit. It was definitely a multi-sector partnership to give formation to the summit focus areas, which is why I think we landed on the interconnected um, view of our focus areas because we really had robust feedback from all sectors. And can I add, Kim, that I think that because of that, um, the summit really is not it's not just about corporate or high paying jobs. Um, it's really about um, all jobs at every level. And so Kim, I think referenced or Nancy did about, you know, retail uh, jobs and also jobs in uh, food handling or food serving, you know, which are typically not uh, higher end, you know, job opportunities. This is about every job. How do we increase um, the economic security of all women across all the different economic levels and Kim I think that's to your credit for how well you and Nancy and the Denver commissions because there were a lot of commissions represented on this planning group um, looking at it from every angle and so kudos to you and your team for making it a very diverse and inclusive set of questions that we're going to be addressing at the summit. Yeah most certainly. Can I just say one thing um, that I think is really important as you're thinking about the summit? Um, as we, um, you might look at our summit, era, summit focus areas and say, wow, they're pretty narrow. We're focusing on career advancement or family-friendly policies. And I think we, that's, that's deliberate because, and we've tried this out, we've had some focus groups, we've done some experiments. When you get down and you really get down to some very nitty gritty small thing, it turns out that you actually can talk about some of the larger issue items. Right. But it's a narrow focus actually that we have found really effective in actually bringing people along to think more broadly. That if we had started with some broad questions and issues, I don't think we would have gotten the, I don't think we would get the quality and actually the robust discussion that, that breaks down the silos. So I think that's Yeah, and I would add on to that to say that um, I think that um, the, uh, the issue of economic security cuts across all denominations of women and the way in which we identify. And that, do you agree that it's clear that if in the summit we included, say for example, we could have been talking about violence against women, which is incredibly important and deserves a summit of its own. Right. But we know that violence against women is so intricately to, tied to economic security and that if a woman is not able to provide for herself, there's the potential that she's not able to leave you know, a distress situation. So this focus, Kim, that you, um, and your team, you know, really uh, narrowed down the focus to workplace policies in the way that you did, I think, is, is to um, demonstrate that the focus allows us to make measurable progress while impacting other areas that won't even be discussed at the summit. Would you agree, Kim? What do you think? Yeah, and I, and I remember, Betsy, you flew into town and, and also more conversations with um, just Nancy and our commission where it's not just about talking about one topic. So that's exactly why our summit is intersectional. So no longer can we talk about and say that let's talk about um, human trafficking without understanding how many systems it's interconnected with, not understanding the system of, um, um, of poverty, not understanding um, just all those things that come with that. So our summit is really an intersectional conversation and all those things come together. No different than that we want to just talk about the experience of women of color, we want to talk about it within the context of the systems in which they're interacting. So every month, everything is, is, is connected. Great. 
Kate, is it okay? I would like to see if Kim might um, say for just a moment, Kim, you know, when we first started preparing for the summit, it was based on your experience, you know, in Denver and your inspiration from what happened in, I think it was 1985. Would it be good, do you think, to tell that story just briefly and why you were passionate about doing this convening? Oh, I was like, I have to think, Missy, you put me, I was like, let me think, let me think why. So, I, I, yes, I most certainly will share that. But before that, I want I will be remiss as a woman of color to not um, share a comment that popped up on the screen. So I, I did see a comment around um, women of color feeling blocked out of the conversation by older white women. So I, I, I need to address that on this call. And excuse me, then Betsy, I will get to your response. And most certainly, that's definitely why we should lead through an intersectional lens. Because I'll be honest with you, my personal experience as a black woman, um, definitely sometimes we are left out of the conversation. And that's why you should lead through the lens of intersection. So that way you're able to bring in various perspectives. And the reality of it is, is that still happens in our work as we approach feminism. So really just really moving towards that womanist perspective and to say that we are having an intersectional conversation. So I appreciate the comment and some of your frustrations with that. So thank you for answering that. And to Betsy's question around why why like being receptive and really um, wanting to partner and then really pitching an idea to the commission when i started this agency which is a human rights agency been around since 1947 the women's commission actually was codified and added to the agency ordinance ordinance in 1985 and when i started the position um, i was able to look at all the archival documents and it was a single convening that led to the formation of the commission it was comprised of 300 leaders across our city who gave our then Mayor Pena the recommendation to formulate the Women's Commission to help support economic security for women. So since I've been in this position, I was like, oh man, we have to do another committee. We have to do one, but not sure how it would look, not sure when. And so when the opportunity came out, I was like, wow, it's, it's like the stars just aligned. And then of course, my commissioners, we all felt as if it was a good thing for our city. Great. And I think it's accurate to say that we have approximately 20 metro mayors who are going to be involved in the summit in one way or another. And um, can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, so we have confirmed attendees. Um, we're, we're hovering at 11 mayors who are confirmed. However, um, we do have, if the mayors couldn't come, they may have also our city is, uh, uh, is it, some, some parts of our cities and towns, it may be strong um, city council pool, strong manager pool. So we also have managers across our state who are attending. So we definitely have had a lot of reception from our Metro Mayor's Caucus who are either on the panel or in the audience. And we also do this cool video mm -hmm. vignette project. So we have mayors who they are not attending. They may have did a video to get their presence in the space to say, I am committed to equity and inclusion. And as telling Betsy earlier, is we used a tagline and like we had our key video vignette individuals say, it's time because of, and they filled in the blank. So definitely um, feeling the support from all the different sectors. And I'll, I'll just, Betsy, I want to just make one more comment to the add to what Kim said in referencing to the call, to the question or the comment that came in about making sure that this is not a conversation that is just among older white women. And I think it's a great comment. Um, and I, I think we were, were as deliberate as we could possibly be um, to ensure that, the, that we had a diverse set of attendees at the summit. Um, it is a challenge, and I think this is something for going forward, is how do you create the most, say everybody's invited, and yet make, wanting to ensure that when you get inside the room, that you represent the diversity of your city. And um, credit to Kim and all those people who worked very hard on, I think Patricia was very helpful to that from its time network, of really helping us sort of manage the folks who wanted to, to participate in a way that allows us to get the diversity of voices that are absolutely necessary. Yep. Exactly. And, yeah, and I will say that Nancy, you know, as a white woman, I think it's important for not just women of color to, to really broker this conversation, but Nancy has been key with our stakeholders, whether it's commission or community to say, let me address things that may result out of some of that tension that arrived between um, white women and women of color who are really in the space of experiencing misogyny. So definitely that's been a huge conversation point with our commission. Yes, I mean, I think the partnerships 
Um, and the practicing of partnerships is what really the future holds for all of us is that we find our way through, you know, making amends when things don't go the way we expected and for us to, um, you know, develop um, rapport with one another so that we can uh, continue to work in good faith and in good partnerships. So, and to your point, Kate, you know, we welcome those kind of comments, especially on this call. And we all want to be called out in a way that is helping to further our capacity to work together. So it's awesome. And um, also I wanted to say that with regard to the number of mayors that are coming, it's unprecedented as far as we know of. Uh, certainly in Colorado, having 11 mayors competing on the issue of gender equity has not happened. And so while it may seem like 11, you know, may not be tremendously large sum of number, it is vastly larger than it's ever been done before. And here in San Francisco, last summer, Mayor Libby Schaaf and Mayor uh, Lee of San Francisco convened an economic summit for women. And that, um, that convening in was just with two mayors, which is fabulous. But this is not normal. What we're doing is historic. And um, and to the credit of everyone involved, it's it's putting a mark in the sand that says it's time to convene more regularly, more consistently, um, year to year to track measurable goals and outcomes for women and girls across all sectors. And so this is a tremendous new next step. And Kim, I know we're all going to be eager to be talking about what happens after this. So. Yeah, Betsy, let me make one quick comment before we wrap up. I'm, I just took a quick look at the viewers and I have to shout out Jessica Skibo. She's one of our commissioners. Yeah, she's our immediate past chair. And again, um, Jessica, I just want to say for me to you, um, like I said, our, all of our commissioners have contributed, but again, like Nancy, Jessica, Carell, Mary. So Jessica has also helped put together this. So Jessica, I know you're over there clapping and hooting um, for us to get this access. So thank you again, Jessica, for all of your support. Um, we did have a couple of additional questions. I know we're, um, we only have a minute left, but maybe Nancy, you can quickly answer. Uh, I don't know if you can't, then we'll send it in the follow-up email. But what kinds of employers were survey surveyed to provide the data that you shared in your presentation? Okay, the data, thanks, thanks. The data came from a lot of different places. So um, I, in the presentation, I referenced materials that were provided by work that was done by the American Association for University Women, by the Institute for Women's Policy Research, from an organization called Catalyst that surveys. Um, you can find that, you know, that they're not, um, these were not like my kind of sociological research studies, but really looking at um, lots of different organizations that focus on um, women and girls and um, their advancements. So it came from a lot of different places. Um, and then finally, thank you, Nancy. Finally, uh, our final question was, how does someone join the network? Um, we have that information up on the screen right now. Uh, it's in the chat box as well, and we'll also be including that in that information in the follow-up email. Um, it's on the It's 10 Network website. Um, and I think that covers it. As, as we mentioned before, we'll be sending the recording of this call to um, all participants and registrants um, who weren't able to make it today so that you can view it later, um, as well as an invitation to join the Calling All Women and Allies Facebook group. So you can feel free to continue these conversations there. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, have, we have another call coming on June 6th at the same time, uh, noon Pacific Standard Time. 1 p.m. Mountain Time and 3 p.m. East Coast Time. So mark your calendars for that one and please visit the website to register for that upcoming call as well. Oh, and I'm sorry. Hello, Senator Angela Williams. I see, I just see the comment come through. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yay. All right, so thank you everyone. Thanks for coming and uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you after the summit, as Kate mentioned, on June 7th. And, um, and in the meantime, go to www.itstimenetwork.org and you can join the network there and share with other people. So have a great day and thank you to Kim, thank you to Kate and to Nancy and everyone involved in the call. Be well, bye-bye.